my name is Mindy Johnson and welcome to the no, 2021 Spark Animation Festival. We are so elated that you've joined in and we appreciate your continued support for the vital efforts within the Spark range of great programming and content all year round. Within our legacy track, I am delighted to share with you this remarkable session which explores aspects of our collected animated past. And it's my great pleasure to introduce a remarkable panel exploring the legacy of the iconic animated classic Fern Gully, The Last Rainforest, which is celebrating the 30th anniversary since its initial release. This landmark film continues to delight and inspire generations. And with our current climate issues, its message is even more resonant today. So joining us is a stellar panel of artists whose talents helped to shape this timeless classic. And to introduce this legendary plan panel, we are so delighted to have the pioneering director and producer of this film, Bill Croyer, known for his extensive career and role in transitioning animation into its present digital platforms. Bill and his wife, Sue, have advanced the animated art form industry wide throughout their films, their work at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, and as educators. We are so grateful to them for their efforts. And we are so elated to present this unique event. And again, to introduce this panel is the director of Fern Gully, The Last Rainforest, Bill Croyer. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you very much for having us. And hi, everybody at Spark. It's great to be here. And it's uh, hard to believe it's been 30 years since Fern Gully was made. And uh, I'm happy to say that we're all still here. So uh, let me introduce <laughs> our panel. I don't know where people are on the screen. So as I say your names, please do a little wave so people know who I'm talking about. Uh, the first person I want to introduce, of course, is my uh, co-creator of everything we did in Croyer Films and the person who had wore many hats on this feature film, including like a coordinating art director, and she was our singular HR department hiring everybody and <laughs> doing everything else. Uh, very talented Sue Croyer. Here I am. <laughs> yeah. Secondly, uh, of course, our production designer <clears throat> who as you may know, has gone on to do stellar things in the world of art direction, art directing some of the greatest Pixar films, winning the Academy Award for For the Birds, the super talented Ralph Eggleston. Mm -hmm. We have uh, two of our lead animators, our lead animators here, we're so delighted. Uh, one was the, the lead on uh, the Hexes character, which has become like the personification of evil uh, environmental <laughs> ransacking and uh, largely due to the artistic artistry of this person, uh, Kathy Zielinski. Yeah. <laughs> and the other lead animator that we have, uh, who again has gone on to a stellar career at Pixar, uh, but really did some of the, the terrific, most terrific acting in this movie, Doug Frankel. Yeah. And finally, uh, the person who made sure that everything that everyone here, not finally, but the person who made sure everything everyone did actually made it onto the screen in a role that many people don't understand and is yet one of the key roles in a movie. We have the head of checking, Pat Cito. Hello. <laughs> and finally, one of our 10 producers, but I can say without any fear of correction, the one producer who stood by us the whole time who made, really made this film finish and who's remained a, well, has had a stellar career again with all these, uh, so many things, but I like to think that Fern Gully was, uh, I like to hope that he considers it to be one of the best things on his resume. Uh, from Australia, Brian Rosen. It is, it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, people make movies and a lot of people, as you know, you make a movie and it's over and you go away. I'm so happy to tell you that all of us here on the screen, in addition to many, many, many of the people on the Fringley crew have remained very close friends over these 30 years. And to me, that's one of the greatest things about the project. Um, this project is a bit unique as some of you may know, because this was done before the studios outside of Disney started putting together feature animation departments. And we at Courier Films, at Sue and I and Ralph, he was there, Pat, and we were, doing little films, uh, you know, Disney title sequences and things. And we were approached by these uh, finance, these guys from Australia to do a feature film called Fern Gully, The Last Rainforest. At the time, our studio had only a few people, but we decided to take on the task. So that was the first thing that was kind of crazy and very different about this project is that we began to make this movie with no feature animation studio. 
and we literally built the studio physically and uh, personnel wise while we were making the movie. And that was one of the things that was quite unusual about it. You'll hear more about that. The other thing that we did, and this is something that has become kind of, well, it was traditional back in those days was to do a research trip. And I'm gonna kind of start our talk today by running through that research trip and some of the things that came out of it, because we felt it was in this case, really essential to do a research trip because this was a film about the environment. It was about the rainforest. It was about a real issue. And we felt that rather than, even though there were fantasy elements of the story, including of course the core idea that there were little creatures in the rainforest that protected it, we felt that having the issues of the real rainforest with real animals and real plants and everything would be a kind of a magical statement to say to people, look, we didn't make this up. This is how things really are. And that was the thing that came out of this trip. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and uh, go ahead and show you a little bit about, um, you know, how we did this. Um, this was the initial crew that came over and, and hired, well, actually the two guys on the top, Matt Perry and Wayne Young were two of the producers from Australia. They'd worked on Crocodile Dundee. It had some success. Wayne's wife had written the book, uh, a novella called Fern Gully, and they were the ones that were kind of the first ones that got the idea to come over and make it in America. Jim Cox became our screenwriter. He had had success at Disney, and so they brought him in to be our scriptwriter. Um, and then we all went to Australia to actually experience it. So in the shot, you can see some people that you will recognize. You can, if you see my arrow, you can see Sue right here. I'm right behind her. And then Ralph is over here looking pretty much the same as he does today. And other people you may recognize are Vicki Jensen, who's currently directing the movie at uh, Skydance. And uh, over here, Tony Ficilli, uh, another terrific animator of ours. So we went to the rainforest in New Zealand up in Lamington National Park. Now, you may not realize that Australia had quite a large rainforest. Uh, and a lot of it, of course, like, like forests everywhere in the colonial world was chopped down for wood, but Lamington was so remote and so high in the mountains and difficult to get to that the virgin rainforest was preserved. And that was the place we decided to go. Uh, this was the day we were taking one of our hikes and you can see Sue and uh, Diana Young, who's checking themselves for leeches, because the, <laughs> when you're going out for biking in the rainforest, they get all over you and they suck your blood. So that was one of the, that was the sacrifices we made to be in this, uh, to, to go out and find this stuff. So this is the kind of stuff we were seeing in the rainforest, these beautiful, uh, unusual, exotic plants. And uh, this was eventually a fair year. We met, of course, the animals down there, this Beautiful things. There's Ralph and I with little wall. These are wallabies, right, Ralph? They're not kangaroos. Yeah. Uh, can I say? Can I say something about yes, the leeches? Yes. yes. Anybody can chime in. All right. Just real quick. Uh, I think uh, just to underscore what doesn't seem really obvious, except for uh, the idea of the picture, uh, it was literally every step you took for over three quarters of our trek through the forest for a full day. Every step you took, there were leeches. <laughs> they were crawling up your body. They weren't just in your shoes or on your legs. They were on your food. And it wasn't until we crossed over the mountaintop into the sunny side of the rainforest that they dissipated altogether. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's, it's funny to think that there's one or two leeches, but there were hundreds. Yeah, I, I thought you were, I thought you were going to say that every step we took, there was some amazing new natural wonder to it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there was that too. There was. It rained the whole time. I mean, it is a rainforest. But it uh, is a rainforest, yeah. And, I'll chime you know, in. That I worked on different movies where I thought that we, you know, had dangers like Lion King. They brought in lions and wolves developing that movie. We brought in, we went to the wolves and, but I didn't realize Fern Gully actually had uh, a pretty dangerous uh, animal encounter too until just now. Well, I didn't go on that trip. Even on, the tr on that trek that day, yeah. we saw trapdoor spiders, but we also saw a few, we actually saw two uh, tiger snakes. Uh, tiger snakes are one of the handful of snakes in the world that are A, territorial, they chase you, and B, there is no, <laughs> no one, one bite can kill like 30 men. Wow. Ooh. Well, yeah, so we were, I think animation is for the uh, fame of, you know, for 
isn't tough. They don't realize the dangers that we encounter. <laughs> That's it's right. More than just being <laughs> the real thing. I, yeah. I had an encounter with a wallaby. I had more leeches on me than anybody, but I, we went to a petting zoo and I started petting this wallaby and he was really friendly. And so then I said, maybe I'll just put his little head in my hands and pet his head. And then I started giving him a hug and he didn't like that. And he goes, boom, as hard as he could <laughs> and stalked me. And I flipped over and it was pretty funny. I thought, wow. okay, anyway. How big, is, how big is the wallaby? <laughs> Not big. That's what was, was scary. It was about, uh, about two feet high, but I evidently oh, uh, Bill has that picture of him. got into his personal space. Uh, but you know a, those little dolls right that there. stuck? Okay. That's, that's what he full did. Size, full size wallaby? Yeah. They're like miniature no. kangaroos. No. Just, just, it's not really a petting zoo. It's more like, just don't get too close. <laughs> and it's not a hug. Get out of my way. <laughs> So we were looking at plants and animals and we saw these, a lot of different animals. And this is one, the rainforest lobster, which is a turquoise lobster. And you can see it's a pretty big thing. And uh, it was one of those, one of the few animals that we encountered that didn't make it into the movie. We, I think we were trying to find a place to put it, but we never did find a place in the storyboard to make that rain, that lobster fit. But we did, of course, put the boa constrictor in there. We found this massive carpet boa. I don't know, I'm sure Ralph remembers the situation. Our our guide, we were uh, driving to the rainforest and our guide had a mail sack under his front seat that was moving. And we said, what is that? And he pulls out the mail sack and pulls out this gigantic boa constrictor that he picked up on the way over. It was in the road. <laughs> so we all got to handle that and that became in the movie. There it is, there's our boa. That's the exact carpet boa with the pattern. So, um, you know, we had these, um, this was, a, there are these fair things in the rainforest that the aboriginals called fairy rings. They would be trees that would grow in a, in a circle. You could sit in the middle and that became kind of an integral part of our story. You know, the fairy ring of the trees. Uh, this was a co combination of things where we saw these beautiful waterfalls and we saw these big goannas. You can see the goanna on the tree just above my hand. Uh, and what we noticed we, when these goannas came out of the forest, our, uh, our uh, host said, why don't you can throw them chicken because we were eating chicken breasts at the time for lunch and they said, just throw them a chicken breast. So we threw them a chicken breast and they would put the chicken breast in their mouth and it would be, their gullet would be so big it would like hang down on the bottom of their throat and then they would smash it against a rock to break the bones. And that is in the movie. You know, Zach gets swallowed by a goanna and he's inside the mouth, you know, uh, <laughs> rummaging around. So... That's, were they not afraid of humans? They were not really afraid. No, they were, you know, wow. no reason to be up there. So anyway, you know, we spent three weeks there and this is Dennis Venizelos and uh, Vicki Jensen just doing uh, developmental art, you know, just coming up, trying to get some of the ideas on paper. And of course, when you're making a movie, the first thing you're trying to figure out is what's it going to look like? And Ralph can talk a lot more precisely to this, but you know, in the beginning, we knew we wanted to have something that was beautiful and natural, and you can go so many ways. And these were some of the uh, early concepts of how we might deal with it. You know, this is a more of an Alice in Wonderland kind of stylized feeling. We kind of liked that, you know. And this is a uh, this is actually very close to where we ended up. Um, you can see here. This is a little more graphic. Um, this was Ralph's pastel of Maggie Loon's uh, kind of her home. And Ralph did, I, what'd you do about 800 pastels for this movie, Ralph? It, yeah, I mean, it was the start of uh, a new career for me. I was actually hired as an animator and uh, I was doing a little bit of, like, like you said, a little bit of everything that, you know, uh, when we were doing commercials and, and movie titles and stuff for Epcot. And then this, came along and uh, I don't know, just something I just started doing. They're almost, they were almost like full color storyboards in my mind initially, but they seemed to kind of go and people liked what they were doing. And suddenly I think Sue uh, said that now you're the art director <laughs> or one of them, <laughs> you know? And uh, so I just didn't stop. I just kept doing them. And, and, and uh, it wasn't 
ever overly formalized, which was fine with me. I worked closely with Vicky and Dennis Venezuela is our head of background and uh, uh, and Sue, our, our, the, the, she was kind of our, our, our eyes and ears for everything and coordinating it all. Uh, and so, yeah, it was, I kind of fell into this and I, I liked it. It was fun. I got to animate too, though. So <laughs> oh, you're right. This is because you, you, you've done this now for all the subsequent movies you've worked on, but it's so amazing because this is a very small thing. This is only about four inches by, by six inches. And it was translated like this into the final, uh, you know, into the final film, the final background. Uh, so this became the look of our movie. You know, this is the, you know, this is the style that we chose. You can actually see the background uh, number on the bottom of this painting. That's the look. Um, we started experimenting with these fairies too, of trying to figure out how, how they would fit into the world and how surreal they would be. You know, this was an early idea. Of maybe they'd be purple, you know. Uh, how would they fit into the environment? Uh, there was, a, there was a, a moment where, remember when Krista was going to be naked? <laughs> Which, that didn't last too long, that idea. Uh, she's, also gonna, she's also going to be green. And uh, yeah. it, it, it's, it's a, a weird, uh, uh, I don't want to say it's a truism, but it tends to be more true than not. When you have a humanoid character and it's green, it can, it can, it can, it can work for a sidekick or a tertiary character, secondary tertiary character, but for a main character, it tends to kind of wear on the audience a little bit and the character starts coming across as dead, uh, just purely because of the color. And we, right. we really wanted to kind of warm her up a bit, so. Right. So uh, we started doing all of these designs and Tony Ficilli kind of led the lead with the design of Krista and very early on, he started to develop these drawings that we all love. We just thought they were terrific. And he did uh, sketches of them, you know, attitude sketches that right away we did a little, did a little, uh, we did a little uh, dialogue test with her. And we just, just really liked this design. You know, because it was one of the earliest ones that Tony did, we had a hard time convincing the other producers, not Brian, that this was the design to go with. <laughs> because they thought, well, wait a minute, you just started. You didn't do 50 designs. And we said, we don't have to do 50 designs. This is the design we like. And we ended up having to do 50 designs before we went back and, and, and finalized this one. This is a little sketch Tony did of how her hair might work and everything. So, uh, yeah, this is, uh, again, when you're exploring characters, you're doing it. You're, nothing is out of the uh, conversation. You know, you're trying different things to see if something resonates. But we ended up doing something a little more traditional. I know the, uh, there was some very, very early artwork done before our company, Aquaria Films, was hired to do this film. And that artwork was way, way, way too uh, designed, it, it had too much pencil mileage to actually work for an animated film. So we ended up simplifying it. So this is the final, one of the attitude sheets for Krista that was done. And I remember this was a very early color picture that we, everybody saw that and went, well, that's it. You know, because she's small, if the depth of field is very small, that's what it would be. If you were photographing something tiny, you would have a very shallow depth of field, which means everything would be out of focus, both in the foreground and the background. And when we saw that, that was a, that really resonated with us. And so, and you'll see this in the movie a lot, that there'll be a lot of soft focus, not a focus backgrounds with the fairies. It really makes them feel tiny. Well, Bill, while you're talking about the Krista stuff, this I've always had um, sitting on my desk. And I think there were just a ton of these sitting around the studio, uh, and maybe color studies. And there were, there were, there were like a, a hundred of these. And I just remember thinking it was so cute. So I've always kept this on my desk. But is that, how close to the final color is this one? Uh, well, my, my, my memory is it's um, a little bit faded. You know, this yeah. is a little bit washed out. I thought, the, I thought it was a little more vibrant. Yeah. But yeah, no, that's way off, Doug. Okay, yeah. way off, outdated. Yeah. Uh, these were some of the original design. Like I said to you, the, 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 the Fern Gully was based on a, on a booklet that had been done by Wayne Young's wife, uh, Diana Young. And these were some of the illustrations from that booklet. As you can see, that would be very difficult to animate. And so we kind of quickly moved away from those. And this is an example of how that transitioned to Mad Balloon. This was a design that we felt still maintained the ethereal quality of her, you know, with, with the different layers that evoked, you know, almost like a you know, like uh, leaves and-, and uh, It was like a mushroom. Yeah, like a mushroom. And that was, uh, 
the design we did. Uh, and animation, of course, you're doing turnaround model sheets. Remember, Fern Gully was primarily a hand-drawn film. And so uh, it, uh, we had to do the, the, the things that they've been doing since Snow White. We developed a lot of incidental characters that were funny and Ralph Eggleston made it into the movie in some way by having a character named after him. Tony Fuccioli and Ralph Eggleston, Tony and Ralph, they were the two guys in the leveler. And there they are with model sheets. Uh, Batty Coda, of course, was a key character that I guess probably symbolizes the film more than any because he was this little lab rat, lab bat that had escaped from the human lab and had come back to the rainforest literally altered you know he had this diode still in his head and that was kind of metaphorical you know for what was going to happen in nature and from the very beginning we had targeted robin williams to do this character and as robin williams had not done an animated voice up to this time and we approached him and he was really interested and we met with him and he agreed to do it and he did an unusual deal where all of his uh, fees and participation profits went to the rainforest fund so that was what a guy, great talent and really terrific person. So there's some of the baddie model sheets and expressions. Zach, the guy who is supposed to represent the human race who goes into the, uh, goes into the forest and meets the alien creature and eventually helps them. Later played by uh, Sam, what's his name? No. <laughs> Um, again, incidental characters were a big part of the movie, uh, and we had a designer named Dan Jupe, who's just a terrific designer, and although he didn't go to Australia with us, we had so many photos and so much reference of these different characters in the rainforest that Dan started turning out these really wonderful versions of them, and this is some of those. These are these ossuaries called, in the movie they're called Ock and Rock. Cassowaries. Yeah, cassowaries. It's right. the deadliest bird on the planet. Oh yeah, I just, yeah. That you're right. I just saw something about that on Facebook. How weird is that? Are they very and close quite, related to the, uh, to the ostrich? No. 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 Oh, no. And they're quite dangerous. I mean, yeah. with, their, with their feet, with those claws, if you get in there, into their area and they don't want you there and they attack you, they can they're, kill they're, you with those claws. They, they're they, ter they, very territorial. They have spikes yeah. on their feet that can cut your belly open. Yeah. Ooh. How large oh. are they? Uh, when, as a, uh, about five feet high. First, we almost cut the feet off in this version. Sorry about that. <laughs> so uh, another kind of, in, I don't know where we got this idea. I don't know if you remember Ralph with the Beetle Boys. These guys that, uh, beetles, you know, because they have beetles in the rainforest that have these armored, they look armored and they almost look like, like you know, like uh, German helmets and everything. And so I think that riffed on this idea that they would, be these biker types. So what you see up to the upper left was one of the original ideas for that. And then we took it and uh, changed it into something, uh, you know, that was more animatable. And this is where we got into um, an ability to start using some of the CG in the movie. Now, again, Ferngully was a 2D animated film, but our company, Quarry Films, was, had made a name for itself by incorporating computer generated imagery with 2D imagery. And so, so a lot, we, as a matter of fact, we ended up having about 40,000 frames of computer generated plotted imagery in Fern Gully. And one of the things that we animated, of course, were the beetles. We built the beetles, as you can see, as three dimensional wireframe objects. And then we would render them and we'd animate them in the scene and render them as uh, cleaned up images and then plot print them on animation paper. And then they would be incorporated, we would hand draw the beetle boys who sat on them. So that's a beetle plot, of one of the beetles. And then this is what it looked like in the final scene. So all the four beetles you'd see the guys sitting on were done first, they were computer animated and then those were handed to animators and the animators still would put those drawings on their drawing table, backlit and they could see where they were and then they would animate the beetle boys on top of them. So. Um, this was one of Dan Jupe's concepts for a weird caterpillar that we saw. We didn't, we thought that would be kind of a nightmare to draw and animate. So we went ahead and made a caterpillar in the computer. And here you see the Hewlett Packard plotter 
<clears throat> you would, it would actually print these out. You can see the peg holes down here. And this machine would print this out frame by frame by frame as a drawing, a cleaned up drawing. And then you would look like that and you'd send it to Xerox, send it to paint, combine it with the hand-drawn character and the background and that's how the character got into the scene. We had a ton of backlit special effects in this movie because every time a fairy flew through the scene, there was a glowing trail that went after. Remember, this is pre-digital, so this is all analog stuff, which means that our effects department would animate that trail and we would print codaliths, which are black, solid black uh, sheets with a hole in them where that's supposed to go. And then those would be double exposed over the scene with a color filter and a diffusion filter to make it glow a little bit. And you would have to animate every frame like that for every, every frame that there was a, a trail in the movie. Um, you know, um, classic cell art with paintings. This, again, the, the, the if, if you remember this, uh, what do you call that machine? The uh, little tape deck The thing. Walkman? The Walkman, yeah, that was CG. Sony, yeah. Yeah. Um, and Ralph started changing the history of animation with his color script to Fern Gully. Now, Ralph, you should talk about this because I think, wouldn't you say didn't William Cameron Menzies was doing this back in the 30s? Um, and well, he, he did, uh, he boarded, uh, what was it, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer as a test for Gone with the Wind in color. And then he did Gone with the Wind and he storyboarded the whole film in color. Um, and there were sections of it that were strips. A lot of it was one off, you know, like a regular storyboard. Um, and, and a lot of it was more technically uh, related than uh, character driven, like a, a traditional, like a Disney storyboard. But he was planning for um, the look of the film as my, and the shots and the lighting more than the acting and of course more than the writing in, in his from his job's point of view uh and so i i, I really like the idea um and and it helps you kind of see where you're going with things uh it's amazing bill i i showed mindy i, I did a little talk yesterday no i'm putting a talk together and i have something that is the color scripts for act three, but I haven't seen this since I did it. This is the first time I'm seeing it. Really? How about that? Uh, yeah. Well, well I'll, I'll send it. I have to, I'll be sending this, but so, I mean, the whole principle like, is just the fact that, film. yeah. Yeah. The palette for each yeah. sequence is represented in a simple way. In yeah. a sequence, you can watch the mood of the movie change. And this has become a standard thing now for almost all animated features. But really, Ralph was the one that... Uh, Every, everyone, I mean, folks have done color keys and, and plotted out a movie that way. But, but, but visualizing it as scenes and kind of really stream of consciousness, seeing a, if that's a word, through the movie, that, that is something that uh, we were playing around with. Uh, yeah, it really was a matter of practicality. We had a lot to do and not a lot of time to do it. So it was really just that, that for me, that's what it boiled down to. <laughs> I mean, it worked so great. And these, again, these are some of Ralph's amazing pastels. I tell you, it's like uh, working with Monet, you know, I mean, look at these simple, but so expressive and so many great ideas. Some of these, we just looked at the pastel and put it right into the movie. This idea, the glowing, the glowing fungus, which of course we saw in Australia. We saw. Really can, can I talk about that, or can someone, uh, Sue? Can you want to? No, you talk. Yeah. Oh no, we um, we were at. I think it was still at Lamington, um, at O'Reilly's, and uh, which is a nature preserve, uh, and the gentleman Glenn Perelfo wanted to take us out after dinner at about eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock. <laughs> And uh, he wanted to show us, uh, uh, well, he wanted to show us a few things. One was glowworms. Uh, and then the other thing was, uh, he said, look, we're going to see some bioluminescent fungus. And we wandered through the forest. And every once in a while, you'd see a little mushroom that glowed in the dark. It's pitch black, you know. And, and uh, God knows what kind of animals were trying to kill us. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but he literally came around a corner. You know, we would see one thing here and one thing there, uh, thing there. And then there was a little glow worm here and then we came around the corner and it's hard to describe it there was a waterfall that had eaten away a hillside and covering the wall of the hillside that had gotten eaten away were trillions of glow worms 
And above that were the tree, they were in the roots of the trees and above where the roots were, were the trees and covered on uh, uh, 30 to 50 trees there were bioluminescent bracket fungus that, grew, uh, that uh, uh, were glowing in the dark. It looked like you were in downtown Manhattan, but you were in the middle of the rainforest. Uh, of <laughs> it, was, it was really something else. Uh, I, I think we all tried to take pictures, but uh, you know, getting the settings for cameras at that time, it was just very difficult to, 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 to get a good uh, image of, you know, so. Well, we got him in the movie. Yeah. Um, this was the hexus tree that had to look distinctly different from other trees, the evil tree. Um, uh, again, more Ralph's beautiful pastels here. Uh, those are real fungus from the rainforest. There's that scene where Zach's lying to Krista and all these eyes are looking at him, which I thought was, which we thought was kind of a funny image. There it is. Uh, again, beautiful, beautiful Bee Gees. And of course, the leveler, the leveler was the uh, big logging machine. We built that in, in as a CG model. And Kathy's fantastic animation of Hexus. And Kathy, you're going to talk a little bit about this, right? Yes. Um, I have lost the screen, though. <laughs> I've been sorry. Oh. I'm trying to find uh, my daughter texted me, and then I lost the visual screen that you're showing. I know we can edit this out. It's an uh, amazing image of Hexus. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe you'll be able to get it back in a minute. You might wait. You could probably, can you log back in? Is there somebody, I'm going to log out and try to log back in. Yeah, try that. You're probably. Right. Okay. Um, crap. Okay. Uh, well, famous shot. Um, Samantha Mathis and Christian Slater. We had a pretty fun cast for this movie. Look how young they look. Yeah, man. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can't remember the name of these guys, but they were pretty funny. Uh, Gracie Brisky is Maggie Loon. Of course, you know, Robin Williams, more wonderful effect shots. And this is something that a lot of people, I think, who don't understand 2D will never see, which is a color markup. And this is something that Pat Cito this is exactly what Pat had to ramrod to make sure that every one of these areas was always colored in exactly the right way. And what a, this is just one character in one little side, but look at all that paint. God. So. And, oh wait. Uh, we used four tons of paint on the movie, four tons of paint. And uh, I, we joked about this. This is all painted in, over in Korea and in Taiwan. And uh, it ended up producing 32,000 pounds of artwork. And the reason we know that is because that we had to consign this artwork to a gallery that was over and it was all weighed and boxed and put into a truck. And so that's how we know we had 16 tons of artwork. If you've ever wondered how much it takes <laughs> for an animated film, 16 tons, and what do you get? So we can literally say, oh yeah, there were, it was, there were tons of artwork. I mean, it was, it was tons of artwork. That's Steve Kelder, the world's greatest uh, PA, looking at scenes. So anyway, <laughs> we got back February 10th, 1990, and two years later, almost to the day that we returned from that research trip, the movie opened in theaters. So next February, 2022, it'll be 30 years. And these were some of the posters, but more importantly, that's the crew. And here you see in the front row, that's Sue and I, but there's Pat. Can you see my arrow? That's Pat right there. Yep. And let's see, I think Kathy, that's Ralph right there. And that's Kathy in the shades. <laughs> and then Doug, you're over here. <laughs> there's Tony. So everybody's there. So anyway, it was a wonderful crew. We, we made this movie in the uh, Stroh's Brewery, if you can believe that, in Van Nuys. And that was a lot of fun. So let's go back to the gang. And here we are. We hope that, oh, Kathy's back. Yeah, I'm Kathy, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. That's great. We may not even have to edit that. Okay. <laughs> except for the except for certain <laughs> words. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, I thought um, we could go around the squares here a little bit, and maybe you'd all like to, I, we, I would mention that it might be fun to mention something about the movie that was really, that in your experience, that was in your experience was one of the most unique things about it. So uh, I'll start with Sue. Um, well, my experience on Fern Gully was 
was pretty much great. And I dreaded the fact that we had to go from a little bitty studio to a gigantic machine. I was, I was really afraid of that, that we would lose our intimacy and our fun and everything. So I was determined to do two things. One, I had to put a crew together and uh, we were able to get people, wonderful people in LA, but most were working. So we were thrilled to get, we just cared about the ability to generate art and also people's personalities. They had to be able to be team players and get along. But then we got to a certain point where the, the animation crew was not big enough. And that's when we had to pretty much go um, to Europe. Uh, my sister had a studio in Canada called Karen Johnson Productions, and we were able to find just really terrific Canadians. We were in London and- Denmark. Um, pardon? In Denmark. Denmark, Denmark uh, just all over. And that was really one of the first times that a studio like that had been done. And um, there, there wasn't Zoom back then. So there was, um, but it worked pretty well. We used FedEx a lot and Bill would do the animation handouts on video and we overnight it over to the studios. And that was one of my favorite things that honestly, it was just a multi country thing. And it, it did work really well all over the world. There were about 400 employees. But the other thing was that um, I just wanted to say, cause this is really important to me. Um, I think we all had a great time on the film and, and everybody, everyone in the film, I mean, everyone who worked on it was just friends with each other. And that was the most important thing. And when I was starting in animation, I had many people uh, who were either my bosses or like the nine old men, they were very kind to us. But I also had experiences of people who uh, were part of the old guard of the kind of top-down management where they believed that if they could make you feel bad or afraid, they were doing their job. They always wanted to make you feel like you were in danger of losing your job. And uh, anyway, and I thought, I took notes and I thought, boy, if I ever get my own studio, I'm gonna do this and this. And the most important thing I wanted to do was have fun and be kind. The people who allowed me to have fun and be kind uh, during my previous career meant the world to me. And the other people, I always felt like I was walking along and they were piling bricks on my back. And so in, it was very important to me that every single person in the studio knew that they were cared about and loved, genuinely loved. And I think when I say that, sometimes people look at me like, are you kidding? You <laughs> sap, you see, you wanna love everyone, you hippie. But, but truly, I, I feel like um, that wasn't just my attitude. That was the attitude of everybody there. And it just kept getting stronger and stronger. And people realized that no one, nobody would dock their pay or come after them if they goofed off or wrestled or did crazy things. or And, and that, that freedom, I think, freed up everybody to work as hard as they could. And, and also, that's just my particular philosophy, but I think there also was a tremendous amount of trust on the part of all the people in a trust in each other that they would get the film done, they would do the best they could, and they didn't have to be serious all the time. So to me, that was, uh, that was just one of the most wonderful things about the whole thing is though, even though um, it, it, there's a lot of, um, just a lot of pain while making a film there's also a lot of great things and we're all very good friends to this day we have parties and reunions and that to me was the greatest thing about it the end <laughs> so, I have very to good say. Too. <laughs> so ralph what would you say was one of the, the one of the million things that you experienced that you would want to there, there's a lot uh, uh, working with you and Sue and everyone on on this uh, in this group and everybody at the studio, 
one of the things that I I want to I want to talk about if it's all right is uh, you know I started out as an animator and I was going to animate on the show but when I got uh, when I was asked to kind of start helping do a little more art direction stuff and figuring all of that out they moved my office to a different part of where we were and the office side was near background and the uh, ink and paint department and the checking department and. You know, I, I'm coming from, I'm a dopey animator. I'm going to animate my thing, whatever. <laughs> That's it on. I'm, I'm just joking, <laughs> you know. Uh, but what I got to do, I got, I like, I got to do this. This was a joy. Was I, I got to meet people like Pat Cito and Bonnie, uh, lots of folks. And the second half of production, the thing that I learned that I've carried to me to this day is that what you want it to look like on a screen you have to kind of work backwards all the way to the beginning of production. And, and as an animator, if I got a fair amount of time to do a scene and I took three weeks longer, then the next department didn't have as much time to clean, do the cleanup. And then the next department didn't have time to do the checking in the next, and it just, it never gets better because folks in ink and paint are like rendering in a, in a CG film, their deadline doesn't move. And so I, I got the joy, and it really was a joy to watch people like Pat have to pull rabbits out of her rear almost every day to put stuff together that <laughs> was beautifully animated and, and everyone meant well, and you hope it's going through the pipeline stacked correctly, but often <laughs> it was just kind of unintentionally uh, 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 like, like a shoestring. You're trying to sh tr tie a shoestring and you pull the wrong thing, suddenly it's a knot. And I got to I, I got to see how they had to un knot shoestrings every single day to figure out how to get this to camera so that it worked. I never thought about that. I never thought about that in terms of production. And and I never the the other thing I saw that blew my mind again with with Pat and and uh, Kitty Schontag and those folks uh, that were in the ink and paint department is they they'd seen it all, so they never batted an eye. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you might hear sighs here mm -hmm. and there. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> As Other open. sounds, yeah. But <laughs> that was really about it. And I, I, I grew to have, and still do to this day, an incredibly healthy respect for that and what it means to the beginning of production and how you think about it to get into production and designing it so that you, if you want something to look like this on the screen, then you got to know what everybody does. And that was my first, mm -hmm. uh, I had a front row seat to see how that's all put together. And it was, uh, it was really amazing and very eye opening. So, yeah. So thank you, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> thank yeah, you, Rob. When you, when you hear students that want to be designers for film, they just think it's making a nice picture, but they don't realize it's what you just said. It's like learning the whole process to get something on the screen that looks like that. So that's a, that's a that is a huge lesson. Yeah. So Kathy, can you tell us a little bit about your uh, experience and what was maybe unique about working on the movie? Oh, okay. Well, um, I would first like to say thank you to you and Sue for including me in this amazing experience of being on that film. And um, at the time I had just left Disney and I was gonna work on my own film. And uh, Sue, I remember you and I going out to lunch and uh, you saying, hey, you know, would you like to work on this film in our film? And I was like, oh, that's really tempting. <laughs> And uh, so I'm so glad that you asked me to, to work on that because it's one of my most memorable experiences of working in the film industry. And I've worked on a lot, a lot, a lot of films, both CG and hand-drawn. But Hexus was such a great delight because I love effects animation. And he was a character that had... Uh, it was part effects, part character. So that was a really neat, challenging experience to work with the effects, talented effects people like John Armstrong and, uh, oh God, there's so many, uh, Liz Bechtold, uh, uh, Carrie Kathy Guinness. Wife. I mean, you know, those people are just, you know, really, really great. And um, Sarah Guinness, for sure. Um, but, you know, so it was a neat, 
idea to have to create a character that would work between two different departments and how, uh, I mean, I don't really delight in just the, um, you know, the collaboration that we both did, you know, between me and, and then all the great input, but, and then Tim Curry, man, is that so cool? Having Tim Curry as a voice, you know, it's like, <laughs> I just loved, you know, and getting to meet him. And I, I remember, you know, telling, or, you know, getting a chance to meet Tim Curry. And I said, oh, you know, I've watched all your films and I, you know, watched, uh, you know, uh, um, oh my God, it just went out of my head, uh, Frank and Furter. But, um, and he was like, oh my God, don't watch that. You know, <laughs> it was really funny. <laughs> uh, but anyway, you know, just listening to his voice and coming up with kind of like his personality into the character of, like an effects character, um, which which was really neat, you know, him being slimy and his voice is so sultry. And um, so, yeah, just lots of, um, you know, and I love doing villains. So he was a great voice to work with and all the direction and the ideas in the story. Um, I do have a couple images. Would you like me to sh screen share or do you want to cut to that? No, 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 let's screen share now. Okay. There we go. Oh, oh, but you know, just in the spirit of just this film and talking about the, the whole environmental aspect of it, this was me just a couple of days ago up in the temperate rainforest in Olympic National Park. So, I mean, I loved working on this film because I'm a big environmentalist. Funny that I worked on the villain, but anyway, so there I am tree hugging just a couple of days ago. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, talking about the effects, so this was sort of like, this was an animation drawing that I did. And so I did an indication of effects that could go on it, bubbles and that there would be fire in here and, you know, just kind of like, kind of how the anatomy, hum, human anatomy of this character, he was kind of a skeleton basically, and how that would work together with things like tar and oil and fire. And um, so I would do a drawing like this. I think I have another one. Um, let's see down below. Um, sorry, totally unorganized here. Um, I had another one. Yeah, there we go. So that I put like some notes, but then, you know, the great effects team would look at that like, okay, this is what Kathy's thinking. And they would take it to the next step beyond um, and really made the character what it is. So, you know, I kind of feel like I did like the groundwork for it, but the effects team deserves an enormous amount of credit for what they added to this character in his different versions of being smoky or oily or, you know, so, um, uh, you know, I just wanted to show you this because, you know, it's like, it, it, that's the thing, great thing about this film. It was a real great team effort and everybody wanted to do the best job that they could um, because we love the Croyers and, you know, and it was such a great experience. And, um, you know, I've worked in, you know, Disney and DreamWorks and big corporations and working at a smaller studio with, you know, the um, care, uh, the thoughtfulness for what artists can contribute. You know, I really appreciated that. Um, and just really quick, because I don't want to take up everybody's time, uh, just that in the beginning when I started working, um, I was given kind of free reign to do a lot of just exploratory work. So I was just trying to imagine what Hexus might look like at, in different versions, mm -hmm. you know, being smoky and oily and how would that work um, and then incorporating Tim Curry's um, personality into that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, here's just some other things thinking about the death of Texas. Um, not, and obviously he died a different way being um, trapped by the tree. But, you know, it's just a lot of what I was able to do was made it into the film and um, and then I just have one other thing, you know, and so again, here, 
it's you know a combination of what I did and then the great effects department adding all their amazing work on top of the framework of what I created. So anyway, uh, in a nutshell, you know, just wonderful. I'm sorry I missed the leeches. That sounded yeah. incredible. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't know about the leeches, but um, I knew you guys went. Um, we couldn't talk movie, about though. it. They're in it's the movie. It's traumatic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, know, the villain, you could have had like these leeches, you know. <laughs> but um, anyway, I don't know. So that's kind of my thoughts about the great experience. So thank you both. Well, it's just spectacular work. I mean, <laughs> spectacular stuff. I, I hadn't seen those drawings since you did them, and I thought I, they're just so great. Still, wow. Oh, thanks. Mm. Yeah, and yeah, um, did I think I was sharing? Was I sharing a room with you, Doug, when I was making these drawings? I. I think so for, for a, a little time. Um, yeah, I worked at yeah, home I, a little bit. I love this, what you did with it. I, to me, I just couldn't get, you know, the idea out of it that you were basically taking on, uh, you know, we were always saying like, oh, this is like night on Bald Mountain. This stuff is really right. powerful. Right. Yeah. yeah. Just think it was like night on Bald Mountain. Yeah. You know, he's, he's my idol. So uh, yeah, it was my moment in my career. To <laughs> <laughs> As artists, we were saying that it was looking great, and that was comparing it to Night on Bald Mountain. So uh, we were we were really proud of the way it was looking. Yeah, oh, that's nice. But yeah, fantastic experience. Thank you guys. I would have been proud. He would have been proud. Yeah. <laughs> so, Doug, tell us a little bit about your uh, unique experiences on the picture. Well, um, I will second that what Sue said that we really did have a great time. You know. We got to see Tony Fucilli dressed as Carmen Miranda, and that was that was a, a very special. It doesn't um, happen all the time, yeah. right? Right. <laughs> and uh, and duct tape to his seat while Julie Andrews tried to figure out what what was happening with him. Um, that was a I guess that was an anecdote we should explain that she was touring the studio, and um, and she was being brought around to Tony's corner where he had. He had multiple ways of, of disciplining himself to get all this work done that he had to get done on time. And so this one day uh, he came in with the bright idea that he, uh, in order to get everything done that day, he would duct tape himself to his seat. And um, he didn't realize that, that uh, Julie Andrews was gonna be brought over to say hello. So uh, I think he tried to stand up and it, didn't go so smoothly. And Julie Andrews said something like, uh, well, it's nice to meet you. Um, I can't help but notice that you seem to be duct taped to your seat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, no, I, I mean, I felt like it was a real uh, family experience and, and, uh, and the trust and the support. I remember a scene um, with, well, Sue, I remember this was kind of sticks out in my memory. Uh, I was animating a scene where almost always we, we really agreed on what to do with a shot. But there was one scene I had, I had uh, posed out, just uh, the pose test. And you said, I have no idea what Krista's head is doing there. And I said, well, I'm going to in between it and it, it's gonna, it'll look okay because she's going to look up this way and up that way and then down. And you said, I don't think this can work. And you were very nervous. And I said, I'm gonna just in between it and, and I think it will work. And you sort of like, you, you did a breathing exercise and you said, I trust you. And you walked <laughs> away and you trusted me to in between it so that it would make sense. And, and because of that, um, I, I finished up the scene and, and made you happy with it. And I just, that just sticks out of my head is like, there was just trust kind of going around. Um, it was a very good feeling. Uh, that's, and. And then you've got, we saw the picture of your very iconic scene of the handshake. Oh, that, yeah, I have that right here. This is my, one of my favorite pieces of artwork on my wall. This and is. I know it's kind of like re reflecting in a weird way. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah Bill's one. got it. Yeah, that's, a, that's one of the greatest that picture. In the film. Yeah, I have the same one up in the studio, yeah. I have yeah, one with both hands out. 
Well, they both they put both their hands out at that one. So yeah, I remember we talked about that and the, how the the way to make it funny was to not make it funny because uh, I think we just kept saying we got to play this just very sincere from their world views and not not overplay it. Just play it natural and and that would uh, carry it. And so anyway, that's the backstory behind the thinking of that shot. Um, but yeah, there was just so much, uh, to me, the fun was that the, the cast was stellar, the voices that you guys gave us to work with. I mean, how can you ask for better? It was like, uh, you know, Christian Slater and uh, Cheech and Chong and um, Tim Curry, uh, Tone Loke, uh, Robin Williams. I mean, it, Grace Dabrisky. Yeah, I mean, it, it, this is a totally Disney level cast. And I, from what I heard, um, Robin Williams was actually being pressured by some executives to drop out so that he wasn't doing two movies at the same time. But he so believed in working with you guys and doing this film that he refused to drop out. So that was uh, kind of a, I remember thinking like, like you said, he's just a really good guy. Um, and well, what else can I remember? Maybe a couple of things about the, the lifestyle. We, it was very casual food trucks, and uh, um, uh, what else? Uh, right, no lunchroom, just food trucks, that's right. Yeah, hey, did you, have, did you have a maquette there with you? Didn't you have a maquette you were gonna? Oh, I got two maquettes. Yeah. So we had, we had a, some of these were painted and some of these weren't. I, right. I have one of each, um, yeah. but uh, yeah, that was really cool. This one, uh, I still keep this on my desk, and um, the, uh, Oh, what else? Oh, I have a couple of drawings, the dancing. I remember uh, I remember when we were animating the dancing, there was a, a debate about uh, how, how wild and sassy Krista should be when she's dancing. And we just kind of went for it. But I think that some of our producers were like, she's not that sexy. She can't yeah. be that sexy. <laughs> and uh, but I, what I was going off of at the time was the Fly Girls. Remember the show um, uh, in, in, in Living Color? In and color. that was a little bit of inspiration for uh, a little bit of Krista's dancing. And, uh, and I think that they were shocked that Krista would move like that. So, uh, so they, they had to get used to the fact that Krista could, could get a little wild. <laughs> well, it worked. That was great. All your facial acting was just great. All of your Krista acting was wonderful, Doug. Oh, well, that's, oh, that's another thing I should say is that um, working remotely, this was, you know, long before there was, that was normal to, uh, to do. It's kind of a, it was way ahead of its time where we would talk like to, to Brewster, who was up in Canada, um, was he was animating out of Toronto, wasn't he? Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah um, in Toronto. And we, it would be so exciting to see what everybody was doing long distance because it would come in and there'd be this excitement. And uh, I remember when, uh, when a Brewster scene would come in, we'd go and like, what's he doing with Krista? And so we'd look at it and, um, and get inspired. And I, I guess we met each other long distance and then some of us became friends later because we worked long distance through you guys on Ferngo. And, um, and that was kind of a cool way to, to later meet people that we sort of already knew uh, way, way before remote was the big thing. I re I'll never forget the day that you said Brewster squashed the cranium on Krista. Oh, yeah. That was an amazing thing. <laughs> I, well, he, he was very squishy. And, uh, and I hadn't squished it to that level yet. And I thought, you know what? That really works. And uh, I, I, yeah, I just, I, lo I loved uh, seeing what everybody was doing with their characters, uh, you know, and Kathy, your, your stuff was really inspiring, and uh, the, 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 the lizard, Salamander, um, who animated uh, that? I'm going to eat uh, you. Was it Chuck Gamage? Yes. I think so. Chuck Gamage. I really, really uh, liked the way he was uh, doing his stuff, and, and the people uh, at work at Pixar have really, uh, very warm feelings for Fern Gully and over and over again it comes up and the young artists the young CG artists they they talk about Fern Gully like it was a seminal experience for them and mm -hmm. I, I never know who sees any of these movies you know so uh to me that comes up you know fairly often and it's really nice to, to hear that they, there's a real awareness of it 
I get that a lot from students. They'll say, I just want you to know, and they'll do this. They go, that movie was so important to me. When yeah. I was five years old, I watched it over and over and over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so my favorite thing I just wanted to say about, about Hexus was watching all of the different layers of it, you know, like, and getting the effects too, and watching your Night on Bald Mountain style animation. I just had to say that. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, yeah. Well, well Pat Cito, you were the one that had to put all the, make sure all these things actually got onto the screen the way they were supposed <laughs> to get on it. So how was that, was Spring Gully like a unique thing that we, from your perspective? Oh, well, I feel like I was the luckiest person in the studio because I got to see every stitch of artwork, um, except uh, excepting for the rough animation that didn't come my way, but all the cleanup, all the, you know, Xerox cells, the backgrounds, all the effects levels. Of course, it's all black, you know, black paint or, or uh, codoliths or something. So you have to use your imagination to make it, <laughs> to see the final result. Uh, and dailies were also um, uh, a little on the terrifying side because if I, made a, if I made a mistake or I missed something or one of the checkers missed something, that's when you would see it after it had gone to camera and oh you just didn't want that to happen <laughs> but it didn't happen often thank god everybody uh that worked for us uh basically i was just running it through my mind while everybody was talking i think every single person you hired as a checker final checker final color you know artist checker um had disney experience and th that just meant they went the extra mile it was just ingrained in them, you know, to do the absolute best you could, even if you were under under a you know a terrible deadline or whatever. Um, but it, everybody just really rose to the very high high standard of work, and and yet at the same time, like someone was saying earlier, it was a casual atmosphere. It was very friendly. Uh, in other studios. I would never under any circumstances have any contact with an art director. They were either on, you know, by the time checking kicks in, you know, in the, in the pipeline, they're usually gone. The job is done and they're off on the next adventure, you know? So, so to interact with Ralph every single day, just because he would pop in and say, what you got, what you got, let me see, you know, um, was a delight, you know? And I got, I, it, it only happened twice in my career where I was able to hear about a problem that an art director had, you know, uh, just a technical problem, not, not an artistic problem, just a little technical thing. And I was able to help. It happened on Page Master with Maurice, um, whose last name I've just forgotten, uh, who's changed his name to Pichote. Um, but I, I was... Yes, 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 that's it. Thank you, Ralph. And, and Ralph was the other one. And I remember it was, normally I, I'm a kind of, the kind of person that doesn't talk much. I put my headphones on, I concentrate. I don't wander around the studio too much just because there's a lot of work to do. And I have to sit and look at all these things. But there was such a, a warm family feeling that I think more of my personality came out at work. And Ralph had asked me to do something and I'm sorry, Ralph, I can't remember what the fix was. It was for whatever, whatever it was, it was small in my estimation. I thought, oh, we can do that. That's not a problem. And Ralph thought it was a big, kind of a big deal. He was like really a little nervous or, you know, just anxious about having asked me to do it. So I decided to tease him a little bit. So I, I had done the fix and I wanted him to come into my room to see it. And uh, I was standing in the hall and Ralph just happened to be walking by and I said, Ralph, Ralph, I did the thing, you know, I said, uh, kiss my toes. I did the thing for you <laughs> and it's all wonderful. And I got the shock of my life because he dropped to his knees <laughs> and he took my foot out of my shoe and he kissed it. And I just, I swear, I just shrank. I shrank into a little tiny person and all I wanted to do was run back in my room and never do that again you know <laughs> oh my god <laughs> but it was so but i thought i that would never happen at disney 
or, you know, it just would not happen. Uh, it was just too regimented. You know, they did beautiful work. I'm not taking away from their quality, but it was just a bit more regimented in its atmosphere. And so, um, but I, I just, it was, oh, I forgot to mention, it's the first time I ever ran a final checking department. And it was something I, I had wanted to do ever since I learned how to be a final checker. And because the first boss I ever had was really great. She was a woman named Brenda Kelly and uh, she was up at Nelvana and she took me on as a complete novice. <laughs> she uh, recruited me from the uh, ink and paint department and taught me how to check. And uh, I often just, it's just one of those thoughts that sits in the back of your mind. If I ever get the chance to run my own department, I'm going to do it like Brenda. But when I came to LA, I realized uh, everybody who had the job of final, you know, head of checking or head of final checking had been at whatever studio they were at for years. They had, you know, I'm, I'm talking 20, 25 years. And I used to make this, what's turned out to be sort of a not very good joke, but I used to make this joke about, well, if I'm ever going to be, you know, the head of final checking at at Disney, which is where I was uh, when I first came to LA, um, I thought, I'm just going to have to wait for the head of the department to die. And finally, I didn't say it often, thank God, thank God, but somebody finally pulled me aside and said, you know, that's how the head of final checking got her job. The previous supervisor died. So you might want to rethink telling that story at <laughs> Disney's anyway. So I was just like, oh, Oh, so the, the chance that I was ever going to have my own department. <laughs> oh, God. That's a... So the chance that, that you guys gave me was phenomenal. I was so thrilled because when I first started, um, I started on Fern Gully as a, an animation checker. And um, I, uh, circumstances just changed and you, you guys ended up needing somebody to look at all the color. Uh, back when I came to Los Angeles uh, from Korea. And I, I was like, me, 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 me. <laughs> and you guys were, were splendid enough to go, okay, sure, you want to do this? That's your room. We'll just start bringing in the shots and you tell us who you'd like to hire and, uh, and we'll do it. And it was just about the most amazing experience. I, uh, it hasn't been duplicated, I have to say. I've, I've run other departments, but uh, for more uh corporate studios shall we say and so the family feeling was never quite as strong and that and that's due to you two guys for you know bill and sue for sure oh thank you pat and that's it <laughs> you're welcome well lastly we get to brian rosen our producer and uh i would say that i'm guessing that your experience is on our front, it's probably one of the more unique ones because I know the whole setup of Fern Gully is so bizarre how not only who came over to the United States to get it set up, but where that money came from, what that company was, and how you ended up being so critical and in interfacing with all of this. So could you tell us a little bit about your, your exciting uh, well, adventure in Fern I, I, come, I come from the world of live action. So... When, when I was approached by Rodney Adler, who was the guy who was financing the whole film, uh, to um, give advice as to you know, what was happening with the film and all that, uh, I just said, I don't know anything about animation. He said, yeah, but you know about films, you go over. So I came over for a week to do an analysis as to you know, how, how, how it was all coming together. And I entered this, world, this amazing world of animation. I was introduced to it and it was, um, well, I mean, I had to learn from scratch. I mean, nothing related to live action. I mean, even your dailies, we have dailies in live action. It goes for half an hour, an hour. You guys have 10 seconds. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I go, well, this is a whole different world. And then also when, when I was asking questions about, well, if you want to redo something, and I was told, well, if you want to redo, you've got to start from scratch. And I said, okay, well, what, what does that mean? Well, you have to go, it ta it'll take another three months to change this. Whereas in live action, you just go in and reshoot the scene. So, so to me, it was learning a whole new world. And, and I have to say, but my, it was career changing for me because... Uh, with, with Sue and Bill, um, 
took me in and showed me everything. We're very transparent, very, very giving in everything. And I, I got to learn about the world of animation, which was fantastic. And it's made my career. I have a little tear now. <laughs> it, was, it was a wonderful experience. So to back up a little bit, um, it was a wonderful people experience. don't realize I just want to say that it was a great experience because I then went and worked for Disney to do James the Giant Peach. And my God, was that a baptism of fire of this corporate world? <laughs> and, then, and I'm going, fuck, it's not what I thought it was going to be like at all. And I, I was spoiled by the Croyers, totally spoiled by the Croyers. <laughs> so anyway, but backing up, what, what had happened was that uh, Wayne Young had, um, and his wife had these books of Fern Gully, and he wanted, and, and he'd been involved with, with, um, Crocked on D and that, and they decided they were going to do do a, you know try and make it into a film, and through a somebody they knew a guy called Sean Levine who who was a, an accountant but did a lot of stuff for 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 FAI the company that Rodney owned, and he said look we can get tax deductions if we do this so Rodney liked the idea of tax deductions and he said okay well let's start doing some film, and at the same time. He had an investment in a company called Quintex, which in turn owned MGM at the time. And so that's why it got, it, it, he got involved. And he said, OK, well, I'll put money in to develop this up and then I'll sell it to MGM. Well, what happened was that when the time came to sell it to MGM, MGM went, well, we don't want to buy it. We will distribute it, but we're not going to buy it from you. You guys go and make it. And so that's when Rodney had to make a decision. Is he going to make it or what's going to happen? And that's when I became involved in doing an assessment of the whole thing as to whether the investment would be worthwhile or not. And uh, luckily I said, yeah, I think it could, could be a good investment. And over the years has proved to be a, a good investment. But that was, that was, um, but that was a guy, you know, with Rodney, he, and I asked him after us, so why did you make this decision? He said, well, it was a great story. And he had a six-year-old daughter. I was making this film for my daughter. And that's how bizarre uh -huh. a film got made. Wow. Of yeah, movie, it's, you know? to, to fill in for people who don't know about it, the Rodney Andler that Brian's referring to was not a filmmaker or a producer at all. The, the no. company was FAI. It was an insurance company in Australia, yeah. an insurance company. They had nothing to do whatsoever with film. And as Brian said, this uh, at the time, Rodney was a pretty young guy. He was in his late 20s, right? Yeah. Well, his, father, his father had died two years earlier, dropped dead, and he inherited the whole company age 28. And so he mm. wanted to do something yeah. you, that was his, and he decided, yeah. to develop, and we were lucky that he, we were the ones he took a flyer on. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah, because they developed some other projects, but this is the one that he really um, fell in love with and thought, I'd like to make this for my daughter. Uh, and, and then the hard realities of finance come into it later. But but um, but going into it was altruistic. You know, he he really liked it, and not that he was. I, I wouldn't say at that time he was environmental, but he understood what it was about. Mm -hmm. So yeah. so so in that sense. But as I say, you you sort of asking what do we take out of it? To me, it brought me into the world of animation and meeting great people. And also, it made me a better producer in live action because of that family thing that you, you Croyers, had created in that company that, and that everybody cared. And sometimes it drives me mad because everybody cared so much. I'm going, yeah, but we've got to keep fucking making this thing. Keep going. You know, <laughs> don't keep collecting everything. You know, no, 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 we want to check. And you go, yeah, yeah, I know. But you all cared. And, and... It, it, uh, and it made me realize what, what, it, um, what, a, what a wonderful medium animation is. And it is different to live action. In live action, a lot of times, you know, the grips and the gaffers and all that, they arrive, they do their job, they go home. You guys never went home. Midnight, you were still there doing <laughs> stuff and animating. And, uh, it, it, um, uh, and so it was, it was the love. It was the love that animation people have for, for this medium. It's so much greater than ever in live action. You know, I'm not saying people in live action don't don't care about what they do, but the but with an animation, and I found that along the way, whether it was when I was doing uh, uh, James and Giant Peach, or whether I was doing stuff here like Maya the Bee that I'm doing at the moment with, with as a co-production from Germany, is that the studio we have here? It's not my studio; it's someone else's studio. 
but we 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 hire them to do to to do the stuff is that everybody really cares it's 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 an amazing career and and people that go into it are caring people that's what i found yeah i think it's you're wonderful. right I remember, yeah <laughs> i remember going into our ink and paint department you know and seeing all the ink and paint women just so lovingly caring for the cells, you know, cleaning the cells, fixing the little wrong, you know, touching up the paint, you know, doing this stuff. And I just thought this energy is going to end up on the screen. This, all this loving, yeah. caring, handling of real yeah. art is going to somehow end up coming across on the screen. I, I always, I could not imagine how that wouldn't be true, you know, and I, and to some degree, I think that's one thing that we experienced on the film that you don't quite get in the CG world anymore, you know, is actually having the artwork in your hands. It's like in that. your hand, yeah. Uh, we, had some, we had some epic uh, rubber band fights too. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and don't forget Greco-Roman wrestling in the halls. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting you say about computers now, Bill, because at that time, everything being hand-drawn. And I remember, you know, Friday evenings, there were drinks, you know, all the things you can't do now anymore. You know, everybody having drinks because they, they get drink and drive and get done. The company could be blamed for it. But but the other thing was you, you had, um, uh, what's it called? Not netball, but, you, yeah, you know, the thing of um, oh, volleyball. Oh, yeah, volleyball. Volleyball. volleyball and doing it. And then one day... In doing it, I don't know whether whether, whether it was you, Doug, or, or whether it was Tony. Somebody broke their finger playing it, and so I, I looked at this. Well, he can't do anything for it, and I go, "We can't play volleyball anymore. At least the animators can't." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't me, but I remember that. So yeah, so yeah. broke their yeah. finger. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, because yeah. computer animation, you can still animate, you can still do stuff. And those yeah. are when you physically having to have the pen in your hand, it was yeah. a bit different. It cast tends to get in the way. That's right. It does. So, <laughs> well, we kind of hit our ninety-minute mark here, and uh, we're probably going to be wrapping up. Uh, Could I just say one more final, thing? Final thought. Yeah, Sue. Okay, I just want to say that to me, Ralph was the heart of the film because I I felt like Ralph had this dual personality, but he was a true innocent, like Mary Blair or Freddie Moore. A real innocent and he when he started coming up with his pastels they just illuminated the whole film it became so beautiful and and he just had this absolute innocence that that made us really be drawn in to the you know without it being corny it was never predictable it was all 100 emotion and yet so he had that amazing quality of an innocent coupled with this genius that had this voracious desire to learn how every single thing worked and actually knew it and so that I'd go I'd go into your office Ralph and I felt like you were just emanating this I don't even know what but just kind of like this energy and it was so powerful that I could walk near you and you he wouldn't even see me you'd go what <laughs> It was a great experience. <laughs> That's true. I never saw Ralph when he didn't look like he was in a rush to get somewhere. Very important. Yes. <laughs> it was yes, my, it really my was the, the heart of the film. You know, usually my desk, I, 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 my, everything was covered in chalk. I mean, you know, yeah. that, was, that was the first chance I got to do something like that. And, you know, I, I, it was great. So, you know, I think uh, we can, we can easily do it. Like, like Bill, I'd just like to say one thing is that the legacy will continue, that uh, the people who have now bought Fern Gully, Fern Gully got wrapped up in a chapter 11 thing for 20 years. And although Fox had the film and we're still releasing and showing it and things like that, nothing could have happened with it. And now a, a man called John Scheinberg and Matt Feige have bought the rights to it out of, out of the chapter 11, and they want to move forward. So they're going to do a restoration of it that Bill talked about, that Bill, you guys, some of you are going to be involved with. And then they're going to do a, I don't know whether it's going to be a sequel or a prequel, but they're going to do another Fern Gully, and they're going to do a TV show. TV show. And the interesting thing with it is, they, Matt Feige grew up on this film, and, um, uh, and he's very, very protective of it from what I've seen. I have a little share in Fern Gully, and so I, they have to talk to me and I'm involved in the company that they have, but they, they own it. 
And but I know that they really, really care. And I hope that in the process, when they go forward, is they're still in contact with you guys to make sure that it, it, it that whatever else they do is it, 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 it captures the essence of what you guys did with Troy and Gully. Well, we hope that's true. That's you're right. it, is a, it is a special film. Oh. Uh, we all feel special about it. But I, I, the other thing I love about the panel is how special making it wasn't as special the group was. And, we, and I know we could do another 90 minutes of just telling stories about stuff that we talk about different that could never happen in a studio today with the whole HR world and everything. The way things operated, the oh. fun we had, no one could duplicate that. So uh, I think that's probably something that we're going to, I know I'll, I'll hang out to forever and be happy that we did it. You know, they say the secret to happiness is selective memory. And I have to say that <laughs> when it comes to Ferngully, I, really, I only remember the happy parts. I don't remember any Me of the too. angst. And sometimes somebody will mention, did you know this happened? And I went, eh. I don't care about that. <laughs> and that someone is me. <laughs> it, was, it was very fun. You know, you were building up the company and then, you know, it, it like always, it found with anime, it always takes longer than we all hope it will. And and there was a lot of pressure and sending stuff, when when you had to start the, uh, sending stuff out of the studio and that. And even, even if you remember with the whole um, uh, 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 inky and painting of it, it went to Taiwan and then it went to Korea because um, we had difficulties of getting the work out of them. And I even remember Bill going to Korea. Do you remember this, Bill? And you flew, you got to Korea and you didn't have your passport. I've no idea how they let him on, but he arrived there, no passport. He said, Well, I've got a driver's license. They said, No. So Bill had to go back to Hawaii, and we had to sell his passport to Hawaii and then fly him back <laughs> to Korea. I was instantly <laughs> deported. That's right. So just just a taste of the story <laughs> of the sequel panel. <laughs> okay, so we're going to wrap this up. So Brian Rosen, Pat, tune in next week. Doug Frankel, Kathy Zielinski, Ralph Eggleston, Sue Croyer. Thank you so much for taking part in this. We hope you at Spark have enjoyed this. And uh, like I say, maybe we'll come back another time and tell you the stories of behind the scenes stories. But for now, on behalf of the whole crew <laughs> from Gully, we want to say thank you for listening and uh, enjoy the rest of the festival. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Bye. 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 Thank you.